I get the feeling that John McHale and Edward Lane got, were well met. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now I think you're, it, it sounds as if you're dead right about the instability, the emotional uh, of both, instability. Of both, of Well, especially of, <laughs> of, of, of yeah. Edward. I, I don't know about McHale's yes. mm. uh, psychic profile, if you like. <laughs> Except to say that he and Dollinger, I think, were the only two of the people at the First Vatican Council to absent themselves from the vote on papal infallibility. And of course, the crack is that Mikhail absented himself because he knew that he was infallible. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it might have been typical of the time that they would go at each other like mad animals in pejorative language in presuming the very worst about the other man's motivations, in having no faith at all in their good faith. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that is highly regrettable. And I am I'm quite sure that many who listened to Archbishop McHale concerning mm -hmm. the commission and concerning Nanko uh, uh, had their prejudices fueled by him and their own worst sights fueled mm. by him. And there would be others who, at a more conscientious level, mm. saw through the archbishop's uh, frailties to whatever good faith was in him mm. and uh, held on to their own faith in good faith as well, and so would have been upset about Mango. Mm. Now, I think some of the same suppositions have to be made about Mango, that uh, uh, here is a man from a landed family mm -hmm. uh, who goes out to an extraordinarily impoverished and neglected place. There was no church on Echo, I'm mm -hmm. told, mm -hmm. when he arrived. There was no priest. There were over 9,000 people. And it was reasonable of him to uh, <coughs> suppose that they were neglected. And uh, I think it is fair to suppose, too, that there was a measure of great good faith in him and even a measure of heroism. Mm -hmm. However, the heroism is damaged by his faults. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks be to God, November the 1st and November the 2nd are back to back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, don't, for God's sake, let us ever forget the one or the other. Uh, I suspect, too, that some of the people who would have gone to the mission would have been hugely and deeply impressed by Nanko. Mm. They would have seen through his human frailties. Mm. Mm. And I suspect there were some genuine converts there. And if I had been the father of a family starving, mm -hmm. I would easily have quietened my conscience about attending prayers with him. There was mm. nobody else offering prayers on the island. Uh, nobody else. Mm. And uh, nobody else seemed to give a damn about them. Mm. Uh, so I would greatly sympathize with the Akal people who went to him, mm. some out of desperation, some feeling that their consciences were invaded by having to do that, and others, I suspect, a few at least, out of profound admiration mm -hmm. for the man mm -hmm. and the fact that he was trying to do his best for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But who knows the yeah. twists and turns. Yeah, of no, I, I, agree. I agree with what you say. And one yeah. of the things I'm, I'm meant to mention, in writing a book like this, you, have, you end up telling it maybe in black and white sort of way. That's the oh, nature yeah. of, of it. I, I but think your I, book is admirable. I, I just have to mention that in maybe the last four or five years, there's the Church of Ireland through yourself, Val, and the uh, Catholic Church in Ackland came together in a healing ceremony. And yes. there were a lot of unmarked graves, you know, people yes. who had gone over to the colony uh, in the later years of the famine and afterwards were buried in graveyards. There were unmarked graves. So if you go to Wacken, you'll see a lot of white crosses marking uh, these unmarked graves in a, yes. in a real coming together of the communities, yes. which I, I think is very and good. Indeed, several were undoubtedly yeah. Catholic people who yeah. might only have been employed by Nangal. They might yeah. not have even come to his yeah. church, but yeah. they were shunned by their families yeah. and had finished up, uh, planted in our bitter ground. Yeah. Now, 
they deserved Catholic burial mm. and they deserved. So yeah. uh, I'm glad that Archbishop Michael Neary mm. and our Bishop Patrick uh, were quite reckless in blessing them all. <laughs> 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 and, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, I, I have a little let maybe God work it out. story <laughs> to tell. Sorry, just one quick story. Um, I, I could find no evidence that John McHale and Edward Nanga ever met face to face. Mm -hmm. They were always shouting at mm -hmm. one another, whatever. But uh, the Atom Missionary Herald has a little note, I think in the 1880s or late 1870s, um, John McHale passed some time on at leisure in the hotel in the colony. A little piece in the paper. So I used this little note to surmise and to imagine what it would be like if the two old men actually met on the street mm -hmm. in, in the colony. So there's a little bit in my book around that, what was going through their mind. Um, let's go back to the title of your book, mm. Starvation or Salvation. The not the title of my book, the title of um, the oh. uh, presentation, yeah. Um, what do we know about the effect uh, on the Catholic population? Was there the division about those that said you should starve and those that say you should go towards salvation and food. Well, first of all, before Edward Angle Live and I there was no formal Catholic church. There were no churches, there were no Catholic schools, religion was very informal. There was really no formal organized Catholicism. But when Edward Nangle started setting up his schools, it spurred this kind of, we must have some Catholic schools, and that in turn spurred. So um, there, um, there wasn't a feeling that, you know, that people were involved in this very formalized religion and Edward Nangle came and overturned it all. That wasn't the case. In terms of food and those people, one of the reviewers of my book said, it would be a great bit of research to actually try and follow the families and the names of those who actually converted now, I don't want to go there. This is not something I would do. But I imagine, I, this is, uh, my feeling is, that it's very likely it was the most enterprising people. In other words, the people who had strong work ethic, wanted to develop themselves, wanted to develop their children. I don't know. It's just me saying, if they saw all of this, even before the famine happening, why wouldn't you want to get land, get your own that bit of land, uh, and so on. But, uh, sorry, your question was, have we, do no, we, we don't know. Uh, the only thing I do know is I de detect in ACL to this very day uh, a lack of people not wanting to talk about that too much. You, but I get a feeling that people know the families that convert and want to live, but it's not something that people want to talk about. That's the feeling I get. Just, just yeah, like no, that, at, at the most, I think there's 8,000 people in Ackle at that time. Yes, I think the that. maximum number of persons who were actually deemed to be Church of Ireland were 400 at any given time. And that was 5% of the total population. Mm -hmm. Conversion rate is actually very low mm -hmm. uh, on a long term basis. Mm -hmm. Well, I mentioned 400 children at confirmation, yeah, so it might have been a bit bigger than that. And a lot, a lot of them afterwards, some of them emigrated, some of them went back to the Catholic Church. Um, so the, yeah, the numbers are, are, are weren't huge, no. Karen, yeah, I just have to find a question yeah. out here. Sorry. What was, was the famine bad in Ackle? I was thinking, see, with an island between having fish, the famine may not be as bad in, in Ackle Island or any other island <coughs> around our coast as, say, in, in inland Ireland because you had fish been saying easier to catch in Ackle and other islands. And then another thing I want to ask, was there formal education, you referred there to the earlier, in Ackle Island, or when did the national or primary school start? 1830s. In Ireland. 1830s. Way in yeah, 1830s, yeah. So it would seem to us no formal or primary school education in Ackle before No, just hedge school. Yeah, came. just hedge school. Yes. Was, yes. Was that to do with the penal uh, laws or 
Were they in operation up until? Well, I, um, sorry, I'd say that was the general, uh, the 1831 Stanley letter. In fact, I actually find it phenomenal, uh, astounding, that in the 1830s, the government set up a non-denominational system of education in Ireland. We're still struggling with it to this day. Uh, so it was quite a, a good system. It's just that John McHale used it in quite a cynical way to counter Edward Nangle's schools. But it was the beginning of education in Yeah, the high schools, I mean, the high schools, like the farmers would have organized schools in their houses, you know, and the, mm. but more in the east, like places where Nangle came from, County Meath, yes. they had loads of private schools. Mm. But in the west, in the far west, like poverty, people mm. couldn't afford to pay a school teacher, you know, a shilling a, a week or whatever it was, mm. so not that many. But yeah, there was, I think, so we have one more question here. Yeah, yeah, just the fact that there was uh, an Education Act in 1831, that mean that schools were set up. Uh, Bishop, Archbishop again, there was once what they said from my area up in Dublin out the road okay. there, and that fell through yeah. for the simple reason that, okay, that the local parish priest, the parish priest of Westworth at the time, Scotland's administrator at the time, Dean Brown, objected to it because Archbishop Gale had told him so. Yeah. And that school was confounded in 1849, mm -hmm. 17, 20 years afterwards. Mm -hmm. So up, there was Jamal schools in the Westport Parish, mm -hmm. official schools okay. set up until the 1850s. Okay. So there was a 20 year gap there where there was absolutely objection by Archbishop yeah. Gale. And then when, okay, further out uh, in the Delphi area, George R. Captain Houston came and got a big load of land from, from the cycle here. The people were all addicted and so on. And he set up a school because what he had heard from Scotland. And these people were uh, Presbyterian. And he set up a school out there. And Archbishop McHale heard about this. And Lady Houston wrote about 20 years in the Wild West. Uh, tells us a wonderful story about this dirty old man comes on his horse, Archbishop McHale. He was in the 70s, in the 1860s. She called him a dirty old man. Was a big entourage, about 30, 40 priests with him, and came in and says, I want objects. I want the cross and the crucifixion in, 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 in the school. Yeah. And of course, Houston, he, Houston was the first chairman, of the, well, board of man, chairman or manager of all the schools in, in the Westport Parish, apart from Westport Town. Okay. You know, and this was seen by Mikhail as, as you know, the Presbyterians, the Protestants, taken over control of yeah. our schools. Yeah. So there was a huge but it's uh, amazing. fight, fight. for, it wasn't just an act, it was and all over no, the But it's amazing that John McHale was vociferous against the national schools. Yes, he was. But yet he used them in Ackle, well, in a very cynical way. That's what you call it, a double in the right yeah. in the West, yeah. Yeah. the the fellow of the East, like, you know. He certainly didn't want primary school starting. It could give the people notions. No, because they were controlled by yeah. the other group, mm. yeah, yeah. controlled by the Protestant uh, uh, landlords mm. and so on. Mm. I'll tell you what, that, that, we'll we'll we take two more, the last two. Um, what, what impact did the colony have on the Irish language in Aachen? Because obviously, Nangle translated a lot of the stuff, but he came to a predominantly Irish speaking island at I don't, I, I, I didn't go into it hugely. I don't think it had a huge impact, even though he did translate and he produced uh, pamphlets. Um, I do, I never, and even though he was able to speak Irish, I never got the feeling that he was highly enthused by it or that he was instrumental in really spreading it or converting. But obviously he did, he did translate the Bible he did, and he did translate his pamphlets. Uh, other than that, it's... In, in your research, did you come across anything to do with the poetry? I did. In fact, somebody spoke about fishing. Uh, there's a chapter in my book where I talk about Tuke going to Peel and observing what was happening on Arnold Donald's estate and meeting us in the and um, The other Quaker from Westport, it just won't come to me. The other mm -hmm. Quaker that had the hotel in Acton Sound, it won't come Savage. to me. Savage. Um, but they, Savage. he, Savage, Savage. Savages. Savages, yeah. They had actually, provide one of the, the I mentioned it because when Aston and Nicholson arrived, there was a big storm and a few boats were overturned and, and some active people died. He had actually had a scheme whereby they bought boats and bought equipment and tried, were try, trying to teach the people <coughs> in the middle of the famine to fish. So I have a few instances of Tuke and Savage and their involvement. Okay, I think we give the drink. That's pretty. Can I just say about the book? She's 
Patricia's got a great way of, she, she describes chapter one here, and precisely, it's not like a, a, a normal, uh, as she said, it was a heavy academic tone. She says that precisely midday on Friday, the 26th of January, 1827, a stern man in the 60s, known for his mild manner in private, rose to address a meeting. So she gives, uh, she, she, you know, this is Lord Farnham and Cavan, but she gives, uh, which is whom I know about from other records, but she puts puts flesh on the on the bones, on the bare bones of history. And I think she does very well. And I think you would have been well able to concoct this, concoct the story about Michael and Nangle meeting <laughs> in the railway arms of Westport, perhaps. Ah, right. <laughs> thank you very much. But uh, can I thank, uh, thank the book very much? Can I just say as well, there was a book published about 20 years ago called English Passengers. Some people may have heard about it or come across it or read it even, where a bunch of, of uh, English uh, enthusiastic uh, evangelists went off, chartered a ship and sailed from Portsmouth to, to Tasmania to set up a colony. And they built their colony just like Dugard, and they built, you know, they built streets of houses and they built the workshops and they got all the local native population in and taught them how to eat with knives and forks and go to church every morning and pray before and after work and so on and so forth. It's it's really based on the same experience all around the, the I suppose the British Empire really, this colonial uh, project, you know, to kind of bring civilization uh, to the to the uh, to the, to the unwashed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a million, Patricia. Okay. Uh, Thank and, you. Uh, and we'll show